I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Live from New York, it's Saturday night! 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 He was the first person to yell that iconic phrase into our television sets. He is with our families every Christmas, he helped make golf funny, and he helped make sitcoms funny again in the 2010s, with the comedic comeback of all comebacks. But then he f***ed that up because that's what Chevy Chase does best. He f***s shit up. And he does it in the most hilarious, beautiful, and poetic manner. But it's more funny than sad because he's Chevy Chase. And you're not. Chevy Chase was once hailed as the funniest man in America. This man was so great that he actually made being clumsy charming. Chevy Chase saw a quick rise to fame that ultimately came crashing down when tales of his bad behavior behind the scenes became too much to handle. He brought improvisation and physical comedy to the next level. And then he knocked down that level and smashed it into pieces. Hilarious little pieces. Delivering us so many pratfalls throughout the decades that his body is now like an injured athlete. Only his sport was comedy. And maybe that's why he's so grumpy all the time, because he's in pain. That's what Joe Rogan thinks. And he's never wrong. They said that Chevy Chase did so many pratfalls. That he's in pain all the time. Hmm. Chevy Chase made classic after classic after classic and then burned bridge after bridge after bridge. Until we were all left asking one particular question. And that one particular question is, what the fuck happened to Chevy Chase? WTF? I told you to stop playing Operation on me! I'm not your damn board game! At least you can get my spare ribs. But to truly understand what the fuck happened to Chevy Chase, we must start at the beginning. And the beginning began when he was born on his birthday in New York City, 1943. But Chevy Chase is not his real name. Oh, no, no, no. He was born Cornelius Crane Chase. Cornelius. His grandmother began calling him Chevy at a young age from the famous old song, The Ballad of Chevy Chase. It's about a bloody battle between the English and the Scottish. They never get along. Let us now take a listen. The chiefest hearts in Chevy Chase to kill and bear away. The child may rue that was unborn the hunting of that day. There's actually a few places named Chevy Chase. And I remember when I was young, very, very young, I was driving, uh, well, I, I was being driven, because I was, I was young, past an apartment complex called Chevy Chase. And I just lost my mind with laughter. I thought the owner was like a huge Fletch fan or something. But no, 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 lots of things are called Chevy Chase. But there's only one movie star. Young Chevy Chase co-founded the underground comedy ensemble Comedy One in 1967, creating several short films including Walk, Don't Walk, about a man who just can't seem to cross the street. In 1970, Chase created a one-page spoof of Mission Impossible for Mad Magazine, and he had some writing gigs for the Smothers Brothers. Chase would become a cast member for the National Lampoon Radio Hour, a syndicated radio series that also featured John Belushi, Glinda Radner, and Bill Murray. Just a bunch of legends. As we all know, Chevy Chase got his big break as one of the cast members, also known as the not ready for primetime players, of Saturday Night Live. Actually, back then they simply called it NBC's Saturday Night. Chase introduced every episode that first season except for two. This was generally preceded by some sort of hilarious pratfall, which became Chevy Chase's calling card on the show. Because falling down is funny. Problem. 
Chevy Chase refused to sign a long-term contract with Saturday Night Live like the other cast members did, and he left the show after one and a half seasons. But even though he had a very short time on SNL, he left a lasting impression and won two Emmy Awards and a Golden Globe and was labeled the funniest man in America on a New York Magazine cover story. Wow! But Chevy Chase says he does regret leaving Saturday Night Live so soon. And he was demonized for leaving it too, with people claiming that it was his ego that got too big for the small screen. But Chevy Chase says the reason that he left Saturday Night Live was because his girlfriend and future ex-wife was living in Los Angeles at the time and he just hated being away from her for so long, so uh, he left. But yes, he does regret leaving Saturday Night Live and says that the film career was kind of just something he fell into. It wasn't really his goal. It wasn't what he was after. You know, one of those accidental movie stars. It happens all the time. Chase would return to Saturday Night Live several times over the years, although it was reported that he uh, was not very well behaved backstage, reportedly, allegedly harassing female writers and even scuffled with Bill Murray, which led to him being banned from ever hosting the show again. Although he did return for several guest spots since the banning, so it was just like a, a mild banning. Good evening, I'm Chevy Chase, and you still aren't. <laughs> Chase would officially make the jump to leading man in the film Foul Play, co-starring Goldie Hawn. The film would go on to receive several Golden Globe nominations including Best Motion Picture Comedy, Best Actor in a Comedy, and Best New Star of the Year, both for Chase. And one of those famous film critics with the thumbs, Siskel, called the film cute. The film would be a hit pulling in over 40 million in 1978 dollars. Excuse me. Uh oh, there we go. My fault, very much my fault. Then in 1980, after starring in Oh Heavenly Dog, a film that he called his worst, Chase would star in one of the most influential comedies ever made, Caddyshack. ESPN calls this movie the funniest sports movie ever made. And that now famous scene with Chase and Bill Murray was not in the original script, but was conceived after filming began when director Harold Ramis realized that the two actors didn't have any screen time together. And even though the two famously did not get along on Saturday Night Live, the scene has gone down as one of the funniest in history of all time in, in the world ever. <laughs> And then one more, and he's right on top of Cannonball. Cannonball coming. Cannonball coming. No! The film featured a mixture of traditional actors and comedic actors. The comedic actors, such as Chase, Bill Murray, and Dangerfield, would improvise much of their dialogue and physical comedy, to the annoyance of the rest of the cast, you know, the, the traditional actors, including the scene where Chevy Chase's character pours far too much massage oil on Sidney Morgan's back, and that surprise and annoyance is real, which makes it funny. Slipping. <laughs> the film Caddyshack was actually panned upon its release, with critics calling it disorganized and only funny about 50% of the time. But as time has gone on, the film has garnered much more fanfare and has become one of the most respected comedies and films of all time. Plus, there's like a there's a gopher. <laughs> Later, in 1980, Chase would reunite with his Foul Play co-star Goldie Hawn for Neil Simon's Seems Like Old Times. Critics found the film to be laugh-out-loud funny, you know, lol. Then there was self-titled musical comedy album. Chase would release a self-titled comedy album in 1980 where he parodies such songs as Rapper's Delight and sings Beatles classics like Let It Be, but with chipmunk voices. Then the year 1981 saw Chase star in two forgettable films, Under the Rainbow, a film about the CIA, Nazis, and of course the munchkin actors of Wizard of Oz. Both Chevy Chase and co-star Carrie Fisher have called this one of the worst films ever made. And there was a film called Modern Problems. 
about an air traffic controller who comes in contact with nuclear waste and garners the power of telekinesis. And Modern Problems almost went down in history as the film that killed Chevy Chase, because it almost killed Chevy Chase. There was an on-set accident where he was wearing a landing light suit that sort of uh, short-circuited, causing him to lose consciousness. <laughs> And then, in 1983, came National Lampoon's Vacation, where Chevy Chase brought us all on a wacky trip that we would never forget. This film was written by the legendary John Hughes, and Hughes based the script off of his own ill-fated family trip to Disneyland when he was five years old. But Chevy Chase actually did some uncredited rewrites and shifted the focus from the Griswold children to the parents, which I think was probably a good idea. Way to go, Chevy! National Lampoon's Vacation has been voted by several publications as one of the 50 best comedies ever made. And I have to agree! No matter how many times you go on this trip, those jokes, well, they still just hit you right smack in the funny bone. Every time. Classic. Still holds up. I think. I haven't seen it in a few years. But a few years ago, it still held up. <laughs> The world would instantly embrace Clark Griswold as their new dumb dad. And they would continue to embrace him for decades to come. Still to this day, Vacation was a hit with critics and audiences alike, and this film actually pulled in $61 million on a $15 million budget. Like, if you've ever been on a vacation with your family or a group of people, there is at least one thing in this movie that you can relate to and, and laugh about. Chase would then star opposite tap dancing legend Gregory Hines and Ghostbusters Sigourney Weaver in the long forgotten comedy Deal of the Century in 1983. Speaking of Ghostbusters, do you remember that Chevy Chase is in the music video? There he is. And he was actually supposed to be in Ghostbusters, but he turned that one down because Chevy Chase loves to uh, make bad decisions. Then came the second installment to the Vacation franchise. National Lampoon's European Vacation came in 1985, and it grossed $50 million. Critics found the film lacking the charm of the original, but you know, it was still funny. And as with so many Chevy Chase movies, the director, Amy Heckerling, did not get along with Chevy during filming. Apparently, she would not step foot on set with Chevy Chase unless she had a plane ticket to New York in her possession, so that if Chevy Chase pissed her off, she could just get up and fly away. But yeah, I like European vacation. It's, it's funny, because because they're in Europe. And those Europeans, they do funny things. Then in 1985, there was Fletch. The film took a long time to get made, with the author of the original books outright vetoing the casting of Burt Reynolds and Mick Jagger. Which, yeah, what were they thinking? Fletch wouldn't have worked with those guys. It only works because Chevy is Fletch. Chevy Chase says that Fletch is his favorite character that he's ever played, and he actually enjoyed working with the director, Michael Ritchie, because this particular director gave Chevy Chase lots of freedom to improvise. That's right, almost every scene of Fletch is pure Chevy Chase improvisation. Whose line is it anyway? It's Chevy's. The film did very well, pulling in $60 million worldwide. But as with most comedies of the 80s, it became an even bigger cult hit years later. Are you in the cult? What cults are you in? And the film's writer, Andrew Bergman, says that there are a group of movies from the 80s like Fletch and Caddyshack that capture a certain wise-ass thing. And you know what? That's what Chevy's ass is best at. Being wise. But yes, Fletch has gone down in the eyes of many as uh, his most respected comedic performance. Do you respect it? R-E-S-P-E-C-T? Find out what it means to Chevy? You know, if I did some sit-ups in the morning or bent over like this, I'd probably feel 100% Moon River. Whew. Thank you, Doc. You ever serve time? After playing a newscaster in the Big Bird film, Follow That Bird, Chase would reunite with his fellow not-ready-for-primetime player, Dan Aykroyd, for this Cold War comedy, Spies Like Us. The film is an homage to the old Road 2 movies. You know, the, the series of films starring Bob Hope and Bing Crosby, that I'm sure all you kids watch every day. These were most perfectly parodied to great success on the show Family Guy, with Chase and Dan Aykroyd even playing versions of themselves in, in an episode. 
But yeah, the movie Spies Like Us, it pulled in a decent $60 million. Then in 1986, it was another year and another classic, Three Amigos. That means three friends in Spanish. The film was written by Steve Martin, Lauren Michaels, and Randy Newman? Originally, Steven Spielberg tried to make this movie with Steve Martin, Bill Murray, and Robin Williams, but then John Landis came along and brought in Chevy. Even though now the film is considered a comedy classic, upon its original release, the film was given fairly horrible reviews and barely made $40 million at the box office. With those three guys, it should have made a whole lot more. But Three Amigos, it's such a funny, fun movie. I freaking love this one. Everybody freaking loves the Three Amigos. Everybody is amigos with these three amigos. And let us pray that cancel culture stays away from this one. We are the Also, in that year, 1986, Chevy Chase would appear in his good friend Paul Simon's music video, You Can Call Me Al. And I like Paul Simon and all, but like, I, I just never, I never got this one. Is this, is this supposed to be funny? Is this supposed to be cool? Do you get it? Comment your comments in the comments and educate my ass on this one. Where's Garfunkel when you need him? Then, in 1987, Chevy Chase would co-host the 59th Academy Awards alongside Paul Hogan and Goldie Hawn. The Academy must have really liked Chevy Chase's hosting because he was invited back the next year to host all by himself. Good evening, Hollywood phonies. <laughs> Chevy Chase would then take on the lead role in the final film from director George Roy Hill in Funny Farm. The film garnered mixed reviews upon its release and had the unfortunate timing of being released the exact same day as Big. And as you know, Big was big and took a lot of business away from Funny Farm. But years later, many would look back upon this film as one of Chevy Chase's finest performances. Also in 1988, Chevy Chase would be the only original cast member to return for a cameo role in Caddyshack 2 which has gone down as one of the worst sequels ever made. The year 1989 saw Chevy Chase reprise two of his most iconic roles, Fletch and Clark W. Griswold. That's right, that year brought us Fletch Lives. Critics would praise Chase's performance in the film, but found the sequel relied too heavily upon silly disguises and less on an actual funny script. And audiences really didn't flock to this one. It only made $39 million. <laughs> And, of course, that same year came National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, the greatest Christmas movie ever made, in my most humble of opinions. This movie is so iconic and left a lasting impression on the holiday, Christmas itself, and our pop culture that the term Griswold House has become a popular way of describing an overly decorated Christmas house. Chris Columbus was originally set to direct this but found Chevy Chase was too difficult to work with. So he went on to make the other greatest Christmas movie of all time, Home Alone. Christmas Vacation was a financial hit, taking in over $70 million and remaining Chevy Chase's highest grossing starring film. And this one is great. Every scene is memorable, hilarious, and often heartwarming. And the scene where Chevy Chase beats the hell out of the Christmas decorations? Well, he actually broke his pinky finger punching Santa. And that's why you notice later on in that scene, he's only kicking the decorations. Chevy Chase is like broken frickin' bones to make us laugh. We should appreciate that. This was another film of Chevy Chase's that received mixed reviews upon its release, but has gone on to be considered a classic, like a perfect movie. And if you're one of those people watching WandaVision, you may recognize the house. It's the same one. And there's a sequel to this sequel. It's called National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation 2 Cousin Eddie's Island Adventure, which was a TV movie released in 2003, and yeah, it's as bad as it sounds. And I want to look him straight in the eye, and I want to tell him what a cheap, lying, no good, rotten, four flushing, low life, snake licking, dirt eating, inbred, overstuffed, ignorant, blood 
sucking, dog kissing, brainless, dickless, hopeless, heartless, fat ass, bug eyed, stiff legged, spotty lip, worm headed sack of monkey shit he is. Hallelujah! Holy shit! Where's the Tylenol? In 1990, Chippy Chase would pop up in the Earth Day special. It's a TV special where several big celebrity names flew on their private jets to tell us to stop polluting. Also in 1990, he would again pop up in a Paul Simon music video for the song Proof. Then in 1991, Chevy Chase would star in Dan Aykroyd's weird-ass directorial debut, Nothing But Trouble. Everyone hated working with Chevy Chase on this film because he was uh, verbally abusive to almost everyone on set, which is something that a lot of Chevy Chase sets have in common. And Chevy Chase would constantly talk and joke about how much more money he was making and getting paid than everybody else. Which, yeah, you know, Chevy Chase has a very strange sense of humor and sometimes it just doesn't, uh, doesn't work. <laughs> Chase said that he hated the script when he read it, but he took the role because he wanted to work with Dan Aykroyd again and thought that Dan Aykroyd would let him improvise, which would bring more comedy into the film, but, uh, but no. The film made less than $10 million on a $40 million budget. And I saw this recently, and it's a very confusing, unbalanced, random film. But it's also somewhat fascinating, and you can't take your eyes off of it. God, oh please, the oh Lord, please, oh, please, God, I... Thank you, Lord. Then in 1992, another year with another Chevy Chase bomb. This one was Memoirs of an Invisible Man. Ivan Reitman was originally set to direct, but Chevy Chase had several heated arguments about the tone of the film that forced Ivan Reitman to go to the studio with an ultimatum. He said, it's either me or Chase, and yeah, the, the studio picked Chevy Chase, because he's Chevy Chase. So horror movie legend John Carpenter stepped in to direct this one, but says that he hates this movie, and said that working with Chevy Chase was a director's worst nightmare, calling him nearly impossible to direct, comparing him to a snotty spoiled child. Critics and audiences seem to agree with John Carpenter, and they also hated the movie, trashing it left and right, failing at the box office, only making $15 million. It's nice to see you. It's nice to be seen again. Then in 1993, there was something called the Chevy Chase Show. After Johnny Carson retired from The Tonight Show, networks were scrambling to start their own late-night talk show franchises, and Fox grabbed Chevy Chase to host their attempt. After Dolly Parton turned down the gig, this experimental talk show was canceled after just four weeks. TV Guide ranked this show as number 16 on its worst shows of all time. Former President Jimmy Carter showed everyone he's no country bumpkin when he refused to fall for George Bush's old pull my finger trick. The Chevy Chase Show, late night tonight. Chevy Chase said that he wanted to do a much darker talk show with more improv, but the studio forced him to just stick to the traditional talk show format. Womp womp. But he tried his best to do his own thing. And I respect Chevy Chase for trying to do something new and experiment with the late night talk show. I think he was a little ahead of his time on this one, actually. The world was not ready to give Chevy Chase his own talk show, and uh, it probably will never be. After having cameos in the movies Hero and Last Action Hero, he starred in the bomb Cops and Robbersons in 1994. And at this time, Chase was in desperate need of a hit. Enter Jonathan Taylor Thomas, who played his soon-to-be stepson in Disney's Man of the House. It made $40 million with a $22 million budget, that's, that's pretty good, becoming one of Chevy Chase's top grossing films of the 90s. And I remember watching this one a few times on good old VHS back in the good old 90s. And as a kid, I thought this movie was amazing because it had comedy, it had heart, and it had like gangster bad guys at the end that would attack them or something. I, I don't know, I remember some action. But I think this was my first exposure to Chevy Chase, so, um, thanks? Hey, how are you, Ben? Hey, how are you, Jack? <laughs> Fine, thanks. How are you?
Then the year 1997 brought us a new vacation movie. Chevy Chase originally pitched a vacation movie called Swiss Family Griswold, where the family would be stranded on a desert island. The studio was slightly interested, however, Warner Brothers executives suggested that setting the movie in Vegas would be a great juxtaposition for the Griswold's more traditional nuclear family. And this was the first film in the series not to be produced by National Lampoon or to be written by John Hughes. Even though Vegas Vacation is Chevy Chase's second highest grossing film of the 90s, it was still a disappointment compared to the rest of the Vacation movies, only making $36 million. Which, you know, is, is a lot if you don't have $36 million. But critics really hated this one, calling it tired and a big disappointment. I actually remember watching this movie as a kid on a plane, and most of the people on that plane were on their way to Vegas, so the passengers were totally into this one, and it made me really enjoy this stupid sequel. So I will forever think of Vegas Vacation as a funny movie. And if you disagree, well, catch me outside. By this point, Chevy Chase had seen his star power drop drastically. Even his reliable characters, like Clark Griswold, were turning out duds. So Chase decided to start taking supporting roles where he could still demonstrate his shtick without the added pressure of leading a movie. So his first venture into the world of the supporting character was in the movie Dirty Work, which is a hilarious Norm Macdonald movie where Chevy Chase plays a doctor with a gambling problem. Chase signed on to this movie because he was impressed with the script, which was written as a hard R-rated raunchy comedy. Chevy Chase warned Norm Macdonald and director Bob Saget that MGM would try to force a PG-13 rating on them, and they needed to fight for an R. But ultimately, MGM won that battle, and the film was heavily edited to a PG-13 rating. It's a movie called Dirty Work. Can't be rated PG-13. And Artie Lang is in the movie, and he actually said that he was very nervous to work with Chevy Chase because of his, uh, reputation. However, Artie Lang and Chevy Chase really got along well and became great friends, so, uh, not everyone clashes with Chevy. He gets along with some people. That's good. Chase would next be seen playing a local weatherman in the movie Snow Day in the year 2000. The film was originally conceived as a Pete and Pete movie, which would have been awesome, but was retooled to be a standalone film without Pete or Pete. Hey, Dad! Now, I'm going to ask my friends here to give me just a little push. I said a little one! Snow Day was actually a sizable hit for Chevy Chase, pulling in $60 million, making it his third highest domestic release ever. So Snow Day was a, was a good day for Chevy. Critics hated it, and Entertainment Weekly gave it an F, but I always say that the critics are dumb. They don't know what they're talking about. Except for the ones at Joe Blow, they're, they're good. Then in 2002 came a movie called Orange County, and critics called it smart, but unmemorable. But I remember you, Orange County. I actually remember going to the theater to see you. Fine. One more. Last one. After this, we let all sick and endangered animals die horrible deaths. Agreed? In 2006, Chase did find his way back into movie theaters with a voice in the animated dud Dougal and the equally as bad Zoom, Academy for Superheroes. It's horrible. And he also did a movie called Funny Money, which didn't make any money. It actually made $2,844. Yeah, that, that, that money ain't funny. He would appear alongside Winona Ryder and Sean Astin in Stay Cool in 2009, and he would appear in Jack and the Beanstalk. So there's that. But now we shall examine his TV guest spots, ranging from 2003 to 2009. So while Chase was pumping out these horrid films, he was actually gaining some positive reviews appearing in some high-profile shows. In 2006, Chevy Chase would appear in a rare dramatic turn in an episode of Law & Order, playing a celebrity who gets pulled over for drunk driving and begins hurling slurs, the anti-Semitic type. And yeah, this is obviously inspired by Mel Gibson's darker days, before he was Santa. And Chase does a wonderful job. And he would pop up as a villain in season two of the popular comedy spy show Chuck, 
And in 2010, he brought back one of his most popular SNL characters, President Gerald Ford, for a funnier die short called Presidential Reunion, alongside several other SNL members who would reprise their iconic presidential impressions. It was funny at the time. I think I clicked funny and, and not die. Betty, did you change the locks again? <laughs> live from New York! This isn't live. This is funnierdine.com. Then came his mega, mega, mega comeback, Community. Chase came back into public prominence when he was cast in the role of Pierce Hawthorne, an eccentric millionaire who enrolls in community college out of boredom. Creator Dan Harmon said that he was a massive Chevy Chase fan and thought that this role could be redeeming to Chase's career, which at that point, as we had seen, had taken a major hit. Chase was originally reluctant to take on the role, but was persuaded by the quality of the writing, which he would eventually hate. And Chevy Chase said that the long hours required for shooting a TV series had taken a major toll on him. And he claims that he never really felt like he fit in with the rest of the cast. Oh, poor Chevy. I told you, dude. I'm the best! You're the worst! I'm out of the group! You're out of mine! And I'm winning! You created a monster. Let's not give ourselves too much credit. I'm out. And of course, Chevy's departure from the series has become almost as famous as the series itself. Childish Gambino himself has told stories of the times where Chevy Chase allegedly said racially charged things around him between takes. Chevy Chase says that he was just joking around and read the room wrong, but you know, Chevy Chase always did push the boundaries when it comes to comedy and, and race. Sometimes it's very hard to tell when Chevy Chase is joking and when he's being real. And unfortunately, Richard Pryor was not around to explain any of this. Or maybe Chevy Chase is just an a-hole, I don't know. Dan Harmon and Chevy Chase would often get into screaming matches on set, because Chase didn't like the writing for his character, and lots and lots of drama unfolded. And at an infamous rap party, Dan Harmon would lead a you Chevy chant with the cast and crew. And Chevy did not find this f you Chevy chant to be humorous, so he just left. And this led to a huge falling out and a horrible phone message left by Chevy. It got nasty. Let's listen a bit. Uh, and your writing is getting worse and worse, so stop that <laughs> Yeah, Dan Harmon and Chevy Chase, two brilliant yet horrible men. Of course they would clash. And Dan Harmon would admit that Chevy Chase can be a meanie face, but Chevy usually, not always, goes out of his way to be kind to his fans. And there's many stories of Chevy Chase being a, being a butt face, but there's also many stories of Chevy Chase being very, very nice to his fans. The research that we've done here, I would go to say that there are many, many sides of Chevy. He's a very mysterious, complex, and challenging person. And the tension amongst Chase and the rest of the community cast, uh, hasn't seemed to dissipate in the years since, because last year they did a, a virtual reunion for charity, one of those horrible Zoom things, and Chase was not present, which is so unfortunate because I love this show and I thought Chevy Chase was freaking perfect. It's one of the best comebacks in one of the best comedy shows ever. And it's so unfortunate that all of the behind the scenes drama has cast such a dark shadow on the community of Greendale. But at least Chevy Chase was funny. Jeff made out with Annie. What? When? Where? Yeah, where? That's inappropriate. I'm assuming on the mouth. Then Chevy Chase would pop up as a repairman in the comedy Hot Tub Time Machine, harking back to his reign in the 80s. And this is just a, it's a great little funny flick. Perfectly casted. He, this, this, these are the kind of roles you need to be doing, Chevy. Right here. And then I say that and then there was a sequel and it was horrible, so maybe, maybe you shouldn't. I don't know. Fuck you, man. Listen, I am at my wits end with him, so you gotta level with me. Are you the mystical time travel guide guy or not? Don't you put your hands on me, young lady. And of course, in Holly Weird, no franchise is truly dead. And in 2015, the Vacation franchise was brought back to life. 
a rebooted sequel, a requel, and this would star Ed Helms as the fifth actor to portray Clark's son, Rusty. Chevy Chase and Beverly D'Angelo would reprise their roles as the Griswold parents, Clark and Ellen, and even though it was just a cameo, he was still nominated for a Razzie for Worst Supporting Actor, alongside with his role in Hot Tub Time Machine 2. And despite the film pulling in a respectable $107 million worldwide, on a $31 million budget, the overall reception from critics and audiences alike was so poor that plans for future sequels were scrapped. No more vacations. After returning to his Christmas roots in a TV movie called Christmas in Vermont in 2016, Chevy Chase would co-star with Burt Reynolds for a film called The Last Movie Star which I hear is actually underrated. Then in 2018, there was a Netflix movie called A Futile and Stupid Gesture. Chevy is not in this hilarious biopic, but it is worth mentioning because Community's own Joel McHale is perfectly cast to play a young Chevy Chase in a few scenes. Caddyshack never finds a consistent comic note of its own, but it plays host to all sorts of approaches from its stars, who sometimes hardly seem to be occupying the same movie. I just think it's weird the Pope is weighing in on this at all, you know? Oh, it's so rude of me, I never even offered you any nuts. Then he made headlines again by talking trash about the new cast and content of Saturday Night Live. Even though hating the new SNL is not exactly a new thing. But Chevy did it in a very Chevy way, calling it the worst f***ing humor in the world. In 2019, Chevy Chase would return to leading man status alongside Richard Dreyfuss for the Netflix comedy, The Last Laugh. Reviews for the film were split down the middle, but most appreciated the performances of the two leads. And then there was the year 2020, where Chevy Chase would pop up in the ultra meta comedy, The Very Excellent Mr. Dundee, where Crocodile Dundee star Paul Hogan plays a fictionalized version of himself. And no, it ain't no being John Malkovich. This is when Meta goes wrong. And when you think of all of the amazing roles and performances that Chevy Chase has delivered through the years, you also have to think of the roles that could have been. Chevy Chase has turned down several prominent roles over his career, like The Mighty Ducks, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, Problem Child, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, The Santa Claus, Ghostbusters, Pixar wanted him for Buzz and Toy Story, and he turned down the role of Forrest Gump in Forrest Gump, and Chevy Chase also turned down the lead in American Beauty, which I'm trying really hard to picture. I think he could have done it. Now let us talk about the longevity of Clark W. Griswold. In a true testament to the power of a popular character, Clark W. Griswold and his faithful wife Ellen have made a significant comeback in the past 12 years. Starting in 2009 when Hallmark began their annual Christmas vacation ornaments, which has gone on to become one of their best-selling lines of ornaments. And the head of my research team, Brad, owns every single one of these frickin' things. Because he's that cool. In 2010, Homeway.com created a short film called Hotel Hell Vacation, in which Chase and Beverly D'Angelo reprised their roles as Clark and Ellen in a story that saw the couple driving to their son Rusty's house only to stop along the way for a romantic night. And hilarity ensues! Part of the short aired during the 2010 Super Bowl, and it was actually really funny. I think it was better than the Super Bowl. And I actually kind of prefer these short reboot sequels over the feature film stuff, because these things, they're short, and they're sweet, and they get straight to the point, and there's just enough nostalgia to satisfy you and not ruin it. It's, it's perfect. I, I like seeing just a little checkup on our characters instead of a whole, you know, feature length franchise ruiner. Another good example of that is in 2012, Old Navy got into the Christmas vacation love with a series of commercials for their colorful winter pop pants. Joy to the... Ah! Old Navy, come fun, come all. And just last year, the year of 2020, Ford released a Christmas vacation themed commercial called Electra Vacation, which is another great short sequel. It's all we need, just a little taste. Don't want to overdose on these 
fucking reboots that just ruin everything. Speaking of ruining everything, that's what Chevy Chase seems to be doing sometimes. And I think comedian Rob Hubel's experience with Chevy kind of sums up everything perfectly. And I'll just let Rob explain this one. And I said, Chevy, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Rob Hubel. And he slapped me across the face, like, like really hard. Yeah, what the f was that? He's just like, that's, that's what Chevy Chase has done to us all. Like, hey, Chevy, and then he just smacks us in the face with, with all this crap. But you know what? I can forgive him. Because, because he's Chevy Chase. Look at all the great things he's done. And there lies the greatness of Chevy Chase. He worked hard and became the biggest star in the world in the 80s, taking part in some of the most iconic films ever made. And in doing so, he helped create one of the most enduring characters in film and Christmas history. That is a testament to the artist who brought that character to life. And I think that we all can agree that no other actor could have portrayed Clark Wilhelm Griswold the way Chevy Chase has. Frickin' perfect. We're gonna press on, and we're gonna have the hap, hap, happiest Christmas since Bing Crosby tap dance with Danny fucking K. Of course, sometimes a quick rise to fame can come at a price. And in Chase's case, that price was an inflated ego that saw him clash with almost everyone he ever worked with. But now he's in his 70s and sober, claiming that he's ready to get back to work again which would be cool, but I don't think he really needs to. Love him or hate him, the one thing we can all agree on is that Chevy Chase was a pioneer for comedy, a true comic icon. So many of his movies are continuously listed as some of the funniest things ever made. And that is a legacy worth celebrating. So nobody should give a fuck about what the fuck happened to Chevy Chase, because he sure doesn't. But look, I still did a lot of movies and I still can star in a show if I want. I still, you know, uh, I've gotten to a place where it doesn't really matter what people write or say, because it's only an instant of, of, of an instant of my life. Okay, I'm finished. That'll do it. Thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We're an independent company, and we appreciate all your support.